Okay, good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you all to our Certified International Financial Planner Program. It's one of our flagship programs here at the Institute. We have been running this program since 2006, so I think this is our 15th year um, doing this program. This program is accredited through the Charter Banker in Scotland, UK. And so far we have had about 150 plus graduates of this program. For those who are not familiar with me, my name is Miguel Pratt. I'm the program coordinator here at the Bahamas Institute of Financial Services. Um, first, I want to go over the presenters in your program. I should have sent you a document bio of all the presenters, except for Mr. Donathan. I will be getting his own shortly. But our first um, presenter for the today is Mr. Mike Hill. Mr. Mike Hill is an SME expert. He has over 35 years in financial services. Um, he's well qualified to do, I think he's doing both modules one and two. And then we have Mr. Sam Wilkinson who will be dealing with your risk and insurance needs. And then we have Kenneth, Mr. Kenneth Donathan who will be conducting the time, value, money, stocks, bonds, derivatives of the section. And Mrs. Christine Archer will conduct the legal aspects of all the financial products um, and financial services. Hopefully everybody has received at least module one of the program. I will be sending you modules two to the five shortly, module six. I will send that once that is been updated. That module is very fluid. Um, I, I know we have at least one new financial services act called a Financial Corporate Service Providers Act that came out last year. So I believe we need to incorporate that in module six. Uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm pleased to have you all join our financial, our certified international financial planner. Um, this course is critical and not just in your career development, but also in the development of uh, financial services. I, I know the trend these days is anti-money laundering and compliance, you know, which is good for helping us protect our financial services, but they don't grow it. So you guys will be instrumental in helping us and helping the, actually the Bahamas grow our financial services program. Give me one second here. I believe I have a few more people who wants to join us. All right. So I'll go over the, the syllabi. Um, first, the, the exam it will be consisted, oh, sorry, your assessment will be consisted of a, an assignment, a 2000 word assignment, which will contribute to 40% of your final grade. And then a final exam, written final exam, um, short answer essay questions, which will worth 60% of your final grade. The passing mark for the exam overall is 60%. And as I said before, the accrediting body is the Chartered Banker in the UK. I put a link down here for you to, to go ahead and read on them. They, they have, we have been partners with them since 2005. Not only we partners with them, but also with the University of Bangor, which, um, uh, which we are discussing, giving credits towards this program, toward the master's MBA program. Currently, our risk and our credit professional program gives credit towards the MBA, but we're in discussions on having the, this program a credit towards the MBA as well. Um, so when you get a chance, go ahead and investigate 
the Charter Banker Institute, they're the ones who will be responsible for your designation. Now, what is it, module one, you will deal with the financial situation analysis of the client or the corporation. Number two, your, cl your client relationship skills, your communication interviewing skills with the clients. Then we'll deal with risk management and insurance needs. Then module four is investment products and markets. Then module five, um, the legal issues and financial planning. And then in module six, asset values and estate planning um, and financial services. Now your schedule, if everything goes to plan, there's no interruptions, no lockdowns, no nothing expected. We should be finished by August 26. Um, your first six classes will be on Saturdays until May 22nd. And then in June, we will revert to Thursday evenings. Thursday evenings will be your local lecturers. And the reason being that's the same time zone as us. So our international lectures are five hours ahead. Um, as you can see, assignment due date is Friday, July 16th. We will send you the question, the, the assignment question and the materials probably after module two. Okay. Um, all classes will be recorded. And so I will send you a secure link, but just do me a favor. Do not share the link. It will be on, you cannot find it on YouTube. It will not be searchable. You will have, have, have a direct link to the class. Do me a favor. Some sensitive materials might be discussed um, from you or your corporation. So please don't forward the link any and everywhere. Just keep it within the, the class, okay? It's just for your, for your um, further court review, exam, assignment preparation. So, and do I have any questions so far? Okay, how much, um, how much, um, how long will we have to write the paper? How long do we have in advance to write the paper? Well, you, you'll have, you'll have about at least four weeks, four to five weeks to get it, to get it done. So we give it to you at the end of May. You will have all of June and then at least two weeks in July to have it submitted to us. Okay. But that 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 deadline for that deadline date is set in stone, just in case it's set in stone, depending on extending circumstances, lockdowns, rescheduling, and so forth. But July 16 is the date. So you'll get your assignment and end of May. And I said it's 2000 words, but we do have a plus minus 10%. So 1800 words would be the minimum, 2200 words would be the maximum. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, with that ladies and gentlemen, what I want you to do is before class, so us, we want to, we want you to briefly identify yourselves, tell us, you know, where you work um, and what you hope to gain from the financial planner program. Um, and if you can turn on your cameras for us when you do the interview, that would be great. So at least we can have an idea of, so we don't be in the dark and um, close this. And so we can go ahead and start with Ms. Well, since Ms. Claudia Thompson is at the top of the list, I'll start with Ms. Thompson. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Morning, Claudia. So I am a client relationship officer and pension administrator with CFAL, Kalina Financial Advisors Limited. And I've been with them for five years. And before that, I was in the engineering construction world. So my degree is in engineering. So I made a switch and I've done the Canadian securities course. When I first came into the financial sector, 
but um, I worked as like financial controller in the construction world, human resources, sales, a lot of different roles, but my passion is finances and helping others with finances. So I'm always trying to better myself. Great, great. So that's why I'm here. So thank you all. And I look forward to the course. Great, great. Wonderful folks. Before we go on to the next person, I just want to uh, um, say that the Institute is always welcome alumni to teach for us. So <laughs> once you, once you have completed your programs, yes, please send in your resume. Um, we, we, we encourage our alumni to become lecturers on our programs. You guys are in the actually are on the, the ground floor doing the work. So it's, it's, you guys are best suited to be lecturers for our programs. Okay, so keep that in mind. Let's go to Mr. Johnson. Hey, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Johnson, but everyone just says Jay. Um, I am a client relationship officer with Bank of the Bahamas. And yeah, I, I was interested in doing the course a few times, but this, you know, last year was a bit um, crazy. So I wasn't able to enroll last year, but I was, I was happy that I was able to get in this year. Um, like Claudia said, I really, I really am interested in helping people with their finances and what's not just educating the masses. I feel like uh, financial planning is something that we don't necessarily pay too much attention to or the, the general public doesn't pay too much attention to. So I feel like with this certification, I can really assist and help those that need that, um, that information, that assistance with their planning their finances. So that's me. Good morning, everyone. Awesome. Morning. Oh, great, great, great. Uh, can we go to Ms. Woods? Hi, Kia, were you there? I'm sorry. Um, my name is Kevin Woods. I work at Bonnet Bank and Trust. Um, I've been there now a little over a year. And before that, I was at um, Julius Bear Bank and Trust for 10 years. I am head of the client documentation um, management desk. Um, in reference to the CIFP uh, program, I've always been interested in um, financial planning, learning a little bit more about budgeting, managing my money more, and uh, I'm trying to assist others in terms of um, budgeting and saving, especially right now. I have, you know, personal situations where family members are not in a good financial state. And, you know, being able to learn a little bit more about that can assist me as well as, you know, family, friends, per, um, individuals on the whole um, in reference to, um, gaining more knowledge about this field. Great, thanks. Thanks, Ms. Woods. Uh, can we go to Mr. Ferguson? Hey, McGill. Um, hey, morning. Just, uh, just a learning experience for me. Um, I work at Gates with Ascendancy, but for me, the course is about learning, you know, kind of works. Um, they didn't hurt me, so I think uh, it's just going to add value to me, so that's why I'm doing it. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks. Okay, can we go to Ms. Pinder? Good morning, everyone. My name is Rodrigo Pinder. I'm the Senior Credit Officer with Sunshine Finance, which is the financial arm of Arawak Homes, where I am the Senior Credit Officer. You you muted, Ms. Pinder. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Ms. Pinder. You are you are sorry, yeah, you actually muted. My apologies. No problem. Rodrigo Pinder, senior credit officer with Sunshine Finance. I've been there 10 years. Sunshine Finance is the financial arm of Arawak Homes. And I see Michael there from Gateway Ascendancy, which is one of our other sister companies. Um, I've been in banking and finance for about 21 years, come this June. And of course, I'm no stranger to the great Bahamas Institute of Financial Services, as I think I've done 
almost every course in finance <laughs> that you have to offer. So I'm absolutely looking forward to um, learning and growing as much as possible from this particular course. Great, great, great. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks once again for everyone for, for signing up for the Financial Planner Program. Um, before, but before we begin, uh, Mr. Hill, I am going to have made you host. Okay. So just um, now and again, look out for anyone who wants to, you'll have to admit them in for me, please. Okay, um, it's supposed to be four more persons, so I'll go ahead and give them a call, see what's up. So um, I'll hand over to you, but just keep an eye out for on the, on the rest, right, right hand side to see if they want to be admitted to the program. No, that's great. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that. Okay, I'm not just, a problem. I'm just bringing up um, the correct shared screen here. It seems to have vanished from uh, from what I want to do, which is a pity. I don't know why this happens sometimes, but uh, it should be to the isn't it to the bottom? No, I've got I've got the share screen uh, switch, but um, uh, the the PowerPoint uh, isn't oh, actually. Yeah. Uh, one of the options for me to share to share with everybody at the moment, which uh, sometimes happens, and I never understand why. <laughs> yeah. uh, but never mind. Perhaps it's because I've got too many things open. Just give me one second. I'll I'll close a few things, and maybe maybe it will reappear, and then I can share it. But if oh here we are, show all windows. Maybe that's another one. Oh. Um, never mind. I'll I'll do it like this. It doesn't really matter too much. <clears throat> Okay, so you should be able to see um, my screen with you all on it at the moment, I think. Is that right? Correct, yes. Okay, that's great. Okay, and, and here is the open um, PowerPoint, which I've got, but which, which didn't appear on the share screen for, for okay. some unbelievably unknown reason. Okay, uh, good afternoon from me. Good morning to you. My name is Mike Hill. I'll be with you for module one and, and two. Um, I was with Barclays Bank for 35 years, but I've actually been in banking uh, this year in October. I will have been in banking for 50 years. I started at Barclays Bank in uh, October 1971, which is, uh, I suppose, quite a long time ago now. Um, but um, I left Barclays in 2004 and became um, a, a consultant. And since then, I've worked in 38 different countries um, teaching uh, finance. It says SME finance, but I, I'm also um, uh, regarded as an expert for personal finance and, and corporate finance as well, uh, along with um, customer service, which I'll be doing with you in, in module two. So uh, I'm extremely pleased to be uh, with you today. I really wish that I was in the Bahamas with you rather than sitting in Bolton, which is close to Manchester. But uh, anyway, I've not... It, um, I've never been to that area of the, the world. I've been to Florida a couple of times with my family, but I've never been to the Caribbean area at all. So um, it's an ambition of mine to, to visit there one day. Um, so um, I hope you'll be able to tell already by now that I'm delighted to be a trainer uh, with you. I'm a, an extremely approachable person and I, I really welcome questions from you I, my name's Mike, so please call me Mike. Um, I'm going to give you my contact details later. And if you have any questions about today that you want to ask me um, privately by, I think I was copied into the email, so you can send me an email, but I'll, I'll also perhaps um, create a WhatsApp group for us all as well, so that um, we can work together and share. Uh, 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 we can we can share information, questions, and ideas. Uh, that would be that would be good. But um, for the first uh, module, I'm going to be talking about um, finance today. I'm going to be talking about personal finance, and then for the next two weeks, I'm going to be talking about business finance <clears throat> and uh, assessing uh, business uh, cases. And uh, oh, by the way. Um, Miguel mentioned that I, sorry, that there's going to be a link with, uh, or there is a link with uh, uh, Bangor University. I, I also teach on the master's program in, in Bangor. So that's one of my, my other links with all of this. So anyway, I'm very pleased to be with you today. And here is the, uh, the PowerPoint. Let's see if I can bring it up uh, like this. I should be able to, I think. <clears throat> Size. 
is now a problem. Here we go. Okay, so you should now be seeing all of my screen. Um, okay, so um, the uh, Certified in International Financial Planner, um, the intention that I'm going to do uh, uh, with you is to help you to develop financial skills, particularly analysis skills and relationship skills uh, with um, the intention of enabling you to uh, build a financial profile of, of the client. A lot of the, the work that I do is um, helping banks in other countries um, set up SME banking units because that actually is a way of helping local economies. Every time we lend money to a small business, we're helping a small business to grow, possibly um, uh, distribute wealth more evenly and to uh, improve employment uh, prospects for uh, people as well. So uh, SME finance is a key element of this. And it's one of the things that we will be talking about um, during this course. Okay, um, one sec. So sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, um, are there some people to ad admit? Yeah, just I'm so I'm, I'm, I apologize. Oh, for, yeah. yeah, no, I'm glad I'm glad that you did. When I'm showing the full uh, PowerPoint, I can't see people in the waiting room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so may, maybe because of that, maybe I should. Um, maybe I should. Well, right, how can I get to? Here we are. Can Can you go? Okay, thanks for that. Perhaps I should should not uh, uh, share no this. And, and then I can see people when they show up. Okay, I'll do it like that. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit the, um, the situation in the Bahamas um, and then uh, spend the rest of the time in <coughs> talking about consumer lending uh, today. Um, if we have a little bit of time towards the end, I may, I may just start on the business lending because the business lending, we have a lot to do in two weeks and uh, it might just be possible to talk a little bit about uh, uh, an introduction to the business lending today. But as I say, my name's Mike. Uh, it says Michael on there, but um, please call me Mike. And please interrupt if you can't hear me, if you uh, want to ask a question, if you want me to go over something again. It's really easy for me when I'm in a classroom to see when people are struggling a little bit with what I'm saying. But I'm speaking with a, a North of England accent. I come from close to Manchester. I'm a season ticket holder at Manchester United. And... I'll be watching Manchester United play Burnley uh, tomorrow afternoon. My wife, by the way, is a season ticket holder at Liverpool. So we have some interesting discussions about football sometimes. But uh, anyway, that's enough about me for the time being. So um, this is based on, uh, th th this information which I'm going to share with you now is based on an IMF uh, country report which was uh, written in 2018. And it's an assessment of the sectoral composition of credit in the Bahamas. And as you can see, uh, consumer credit is blue on the right hand side, and that's 38% of total uh, credits uh, in the Bahamas. 43% uh, is residential mortgages. Um, the uh, business credit is 17%, and commercial mortgages is quite a small uh, 2%. But um, it's quite interesting, such a lot of the credit in, in your country is, is effectively either consumer credit or residential mortgages. Um, what are we talking about here? 70, 80, um, uh, 80 something percent, which is, which is actually uh, a lot. Um, in my experience, uh, I, I'm used to countries where it's kind of 50, 50, 50 between business and and personal, so you have a, a big um, uh, sway uh, towards the um, uh, the personal sector there. Um, NPLs is quite high at the moment, which is a, which is a concern. The average NPL is uh, for the country is a little over um, uh, or around about nine percent, and one bank is uh, over eleven percent. So that's quite um, quite a concern. Uh, that NPLs are so high because the, um, the average loan rate that banks charge, the margin which we, which we earn on the loan is something usually, I haven't actually been able to discover what it is in, in, uh, in Bahamas, but 
the average rate that we charge is between two to three percent. So if we're getting two to three percent or your bank's getting two, two to three percent on the total portfolio, but then non-performing loans are 11 percent of the total portfolio, I hope that you can see that uh, at the moment or at the time that this report was written, uh, that the, uh, the banks in your country uh, are, are and were losing money on, on lending money, which isn't always a uh, uh, very good uh, business practice really. So getting non-performing loans down is a really um, important uh, thing for the banks to be, to be focusing on and good credit assessment is a lot of the um, of the answer to that problem. So I hope that um, the next uh, three weeks today and the next two weeks in terms of lending, and then the following three weeks on um, uh, customer relationship skills, when we'll actually be doing uh, a lending case. I have a I have a video uh, lending case uh, which will be assessing, which is quite which is an interesting. Uh, business case also. So we'll be looking at these business cases and hopefully um, uh, helping to improve uh, uh, business assessment and certainly improving your uh, business assessment skills and uh, personal uh, sector assessment skills. <clears throat> so uh, the NPL uh, composition, non-performing loans, NPL is non-performing loans, by the way. Um, the, the composition of that is 61% is mortgages. So that's interesting that so many um, domestic mortgages are, are non-performing loans because uh, mostly it's to be the, the safest type of lending in any country. People, that's where people live. If I don't pay a rent, I pay a mortgage on my domestic property. I expect to live there. So it's one of the top um, um, things in my in my budget that I should be paying. So the fact that 61% of uh, non-performing loans are mortgages was a big surprise to me when I saw that. 27% uh, is consumer credit. So that's uh, personal loans for cars and for what anything else other than uh, domestic property. And then the commercial credit is actually uh, comparatively low at 12% of the total non-performing loans. Uh, but um, the total assets which are non-performing is, is 256 billion, which is quite a lot, isn't it? Quite a lot of money that isn't performing at the moment. <clears throat> it's considered to be uh, in some way doubtful. Uh, nevertheless, um, banks are reasonably uh, profitable in uh, in the Bahamas. This is the dom domestic uh, banking system, and this shows um, um, the red at the top non-interest um, um, ex, ex sorry non-interest income. Then um, the blue uh, big blue chunk is interest income. Then you can see provisions for bad debts, the um, non-interest expenses, and then the, the blue line is return on equity. And in 2014, banks were making a loss in your country, which obviously isn't good. At the moment, uh, up to June uh, 2018, which again is the most recent information I could get about uh, the Bahamas, uh, return on equity is about 8%. So that's, I, I guess, reasonably um, satisfactory in spite of these high uh, non-performing loans. You can see that, um, Bad debt write-offs is actually quite a small uh, section um, uh, overall, really. Uh, um, but uh, okay, final slide about this. Um, these are the arrears, and you can see um, the uh, consumer arrears are at the bottom there, um, round round about um, five, just five percent. Then we've got mortgage arrears. Again, I, I, I say that's a big surprise to me that um, mortgage arrears should be so so high. And then uh, at the top is the commercial arrears. So uh, something to, to think about when we're thinking about uh, mortgages and we're thinking about loans, how can we be sure that um, we're um, lending well to our clients? So how can we be sure that we're, we're making the right decisions? How can we, we be sure that 
our clients aren't over committing themselves and that they have the capacity to repay uh, the loans which we've granted to them. So um, I'm still watching out for people arriving, which is why he's seeing so much of that. I'll bring this over here. I can make this a little bit bigger at least. <clears throat> Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> that was clever. That was supposed to pop up later, but uh, because I'm not in in um, uh, screen mode, it's not uh, it's not doing that. So um, with personal lending, we have um, secured lending, whereby people give us uh, give the bank collateral for the loan. We have unsecured uh, lending. Uh, we have um, loans which have a variable interest rate. We have loans which have uh, a fixed interest rate, and we also agree overdrafts on uh, uh, current accounts to allow people to, um, to borrow more money. Uh, unsecured lending would include credit cards, car loans, uh, loans for uh, other kind of large domestic items that people want. But personal lending is mostly about personal, personal needs. <clears throat> so what's the goal? Well, the, the bank's commercial uh, loan application process has five, four pro primary uh, objectives. One, to generate a flow of consumer applications to meet the bank's um, loan objectives. Uh, each of your banks will have a loan target, uh, um, number of loans, loan drawdowns that you have uh, each month, each year to achieve the, uh, uh, the financial targets of the bank. I, I'm sure that you all have targets within your bank and it's fun achieving them by the end of the year isn't it when you all get your exceed bonuses um what we need to do of course before we make a lending decision is obtain enough information to allow the bank to make the best possible loan decision and if you're in a lending role that's clearly your uh, your uh need uh, i noticed that some of you uh, are um client relationship officers which doesn't always uh, imply uh, lending because uh, you're, you're also giving financial advice as well. But uh, the same thing holds, holds uh, true really that um, we need as much financial information as possible about incomings and outgoings and commitments and assets and liabilities so that we get a, a financial picture of the client so that we can make a reasonable estimate as to whether they are capable of repaying any loans or doing any other financial um, things which, we've, which we uh, may be uh, talking about. Um, I was skipping ahead there. We need to comply with the regulations with the, which the central bank has um, uh, laid out and with Basel II and Basel III, these uh, regulations to make sure that lending is as safe as possible so that um, during financial crisis, which unfortunately occur too often, the banks aren't put under too much um, um, financial pressure and that they can um, with, withstand the storms which do uh, come along from time to time. Probably the, uh, the, the worst and most recent financial crisis was 2008, 2009, and many large banks suffered uh, severely during that time. Two um, UK banks, two of the largest banks in the world pre the crisis um, got into so much financial difficulty that the government uh, had to bail them out and uh, the shareholders lost all of the money and the government uh, uh, actually bought the capital of those two banks. Um, so that just shows you how serious it was. The bank that I used to work for, Barclays, which I left in 2004, um, they managed to get a, a huge injection of finance from Qatar, otherwise they probably would have uh, suffered the same uh, the same uh, fate, but shares which I owned in uh, Barclays uh, pre the pre the um, the crisis, which were worth about uh, eight pounds each, are presently worth one pound eighty. So, and by the way, uh, by uh, in in the darkest days of the crisis, Barclays shares were worth about twenty or thirty pence. So that's a big recovery. Uh, I wasn't brave enough to buy any shares at 20 or 30 pence because I thought I might lose even more money. Uh, but they have recovered a little bit, but certainly not as much as when I first acquired them. So um, 
uh, compliance with regulations is a key element of keeping our banks secure, keeping them um, that they're not in a situation where, uh, where they're likely to fail. And that would be terrible for the bank, terrible for the, the customers, terrible for the shareholders. But it, it's also terrible for the country because um, uh, each country's economy relies so heavily on uh, the banking sector. And the banking crisis causes, um, uh, whether you like it or not, will cause an economic crisis within your country. And finally, uh, we need to give uh, a timely response to customers' requests. Um, I'm used now to seeing uh, loans turn around in 24 hours for, for business customers and uh, in, in a few hours or even less for, for personal customers for most uh, requests. I'm working with a bank in Ethiopia at the moment and they give a, a loan request um, answer within eight uh, to 10 weeks, something ridiculous like that. So I'm working with them on developing a strategy and developing processes so that they could improve uh, the speed and, and give more timely response. Because clearly, if somebody wants to borrow money today, receiving an answer in eight or 10 weeks' time is not a particularly uh, good situation to be in. So this is uh, for you to answer now. I'm going to ask you some questions. So I'm going to reduce this a little bit, and I'm going to bring up my, uh, my whiteboard again. And I'm going to ask you, when we're lending money. I don't know if you have any experience in lending money or not, but it doesn't matter whether you do or you don't. When we're lending um, uh, money, uh, what do you think we should uh, find out about the clients? What, how, how should we start with our assessment? What, sh what should our assessment be? So please unmute yourself and and join in the conversation. I, I want this to be a discussion, please, between us, and we'll build up a kind of a picture of what we're trying to trying to achieve. Morning, can you? Hi, good morning. Um, definitely, we need to identify the income, the total okay. income, totally um, not the main source, but other um, other other incomes that. They do whether it be shares, stocks, side hustle, whatever the case may be, and also calculate the total amount of expenses they um, they project to have per month. Um, if they are a house, if they own a house and a mortgage, how much is their mortgage? Um, the interest rate, um, monthly average, electricity, etc. And okay. then if you have any other dependents, um, children, you have to see yeah. okay, deduct out how much they usually spend on the children per month. Okay. So in the amount of disposable income they have would yeah. determine the amount of money we could lend them or if we could even lend them any money at all. Okay, that's good. Uh, that's really good. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else got anything else to add to what was just said then? Um, I just want to add after income, you want to look at credit history. Oh, yes, sure. Yeah, so, you, so if um, the client is a familiar client at the institution, you'll look at their repayment history with um, your institution, and then you also would find out if they have any credit facilities or anything, any place else, and how, yeah. how they're managing those. So pretty much assess the risk. Okay. Repayment. Good, thank you. Anything else? We can take it a step further also and take a look at the um, the skill level of the applicant sure. this, will, this will determine um, or possibly give insight into their capacity to earn additional monies sure. or their earning capacity based okay. on their skill set so that's good because um skills does give you some kind of an indication about earning earning capacity but not only earning capacity, but also employability as well. Uh, people with uh, high skill levels are more likely to be uh, employable and, and find it easier to get a job than people uh, who are lower skilled. So um, even, unfortunately, uh, we often see um, the economy of a country kind of go up and down like this. 
And during these downslides, pe uh, people can become unemployed, find it, uh, unemployment levels rise uh, in the country. And um, even people who are highly uh, qualified, highly skilled uh, may lose the job, but it can be easier for them to become re-employed. Uh, so how employable are, are people is a, is a really uh, interesting thing uh, to think about when you're thinking about uh, people's uh, skills and people's knowledge. So that's another good thing to bring in. Okay, uh, anything else? I know Kinioka, I hope I pronounced that correctly. She spoke of um, if they were homeowners, but we can also look at assets, okay. any tangible assets that they may have. Um, let's just say they own, um, besides stocks and bonds, okay. vehicles, automobiles, sure. maybe some land property. Yeah. So. Uh, like you say, lots and lots of tang tangible assets, but, uh, but, but you're quite right. Um, we do look at people and say, what is their accumulated wealth? How, what kind of people are they? Have they um, accumulated wealth? Have they, do they have assets or are they the, the kind of people who earn $2,000 and spend $3,000? So they end up with no uh, assets at all. They're in um, uh, a totally um, insolvent kind of situation. So uh, thinking about their uh, capacity and their ability to uh, to gather uh, assets around themselves is important and clearly age has uh, an impact on that because younger people haven't had the opportunity to accumulate uh, many assets so we can actually look at people in life stages younger people who go to university they're often struggling need cash so they're in a borrowing situation then perhaps when you leave university, uh, you may be getting into relationships, meeting people, finding a place to live, leaving home. So in a borrowing situation, not a, an asset rich situation, but as uh, th then uh, the kids uh, get, you have kids and you start needing to pay for education and paying for it, additional uh, uh, members of the family. And it's when you get into uh, the stage that the kids have left university <laughs> that uh, people's assets truly build up unless they're, unless they're particularly uh, in very high earning jobs at the moment, chief executives or senior partners in law firms, those kind of things. Um, the ordinary Joe, the ordinary person goes through these life stages of kind of shortages of cash and trying to gather around themselves uh, some assets and, and some uh, some security and some uh, some some wealth, but it takes time for us to uh, w work up the ladder. And it, it's, it tends to be that when we getting uh, past the age when the children have uh, left home, then at that stage, house mortgages uh, tend to have been uh, paid off, and at that stage, more wealth can be uh, can be uh, uh, gathered, acquired collected, uh, thinking of a better word all of the time. So uh, sure, I'm thinking of all of these things when I'm when I'm thinking about this. Um, anybody got anything to add? I've got a couple of things that I wouldn't mind uh, staying still about this, but I'm, I'm interested to hear if anybody has anything else to say before I, I start. Uh, what about health? Is what's, that... about, health. what's about, did you say health? Yes. Yeah, health. yeah, you're right because um, uh, health is is part of this employability thing, isn't it? And this uh, capacity, I suppose. Um, I suppose what we're thinking about is repayment capacity, and part of that is skills, and part of that is health, and part. So that is the that's accumulation that we've been talking about. But um, clearly, uh, health will have an impact on people's um, ability to uh, to repay uh, loans. You're absolutely right. Anything else? Um, what about um, stability? Stability. Yes. Is, was that you said? What you said? Yes. Yeah. Stability. 
that's actually one of the words that I use in the script. And when, when we're assessing um, financial uh, uh, customers, um, personal customers, um, I developed this uh, short mnemonic a few years ago, um, which Keith and I uh, like. It isn't a widely used one, but it's, it's, it's quite nice. And the S stands for stability, state stability factors. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what those are in a second. The second one talks about attributes and skills. And the third one talks about serviceability. Serviceability, we use serviceability to say uh, how capable are people of, uh, of repaying the loans? Is the loan serviceable? So stability factors are things like how long have you lived in the house? How long have you been in a job? Uh, how long have they been married? How old are they? The people who tend to, this is um, um, based on history, I, I guess, lending history. People who tend to stay in places for a long time uh, tend to be more stable, uh, can be safe risks. That isn't to say that all people who stay in the same place are uh, uh, low risk. But stable people have a tendency to be uh, um, uh, lower risk clients. So looking at their stability, rather than people who are moving every six months, um, there's one thought when people are moving uh, so often, have they been kicked out of places? Are they trying to avoid creditors? Why are they moving so often? Is it, it's not just about being unsettled that there's some other reason for it than that. And if people are always changing job, is it because they can't hold the job because they're not very good at it? Or are they being promoted rapidly and getting good promotions and getting good uh, salary increases? So we need to be thinking uh, carefully about uh, these things and repayment capacity is a lot of that. Um, thinking about their attributes, their skills, their health, these are all attributes. And then thinking about uh, repayment capacity or re repayment uh, ability. Another thing when we're thinking about repayment um, uh, capacity or repayment ability is how sustainable is it? If my loan to them is going to be a three-year loan, will they still be in this gainful employment in three years' time? What, what are the likely... Um, What's the economic trends at the moment? What's happening to the economy? Are we expecting some uh, some shock to the economy? And what would what, what would be the imp impact on these particular customers if there was a shock to the economy? I guess most people hadn't considered the possibility that there was going to be a pandemic um, uh, just over twelve months ago. It was just beginning to emerge after Christmas. Um, um, uh, 2019 that perhaps there was a problem in in China but very few people in those days were were uh, were conscious that there's going to be something so dramatic that we would be in national lockdowns and uh, closing down pretty much closing down uh, economies and the fact that uh, so many people have been able to still repay the loans uh, during these uh, difficult times is is quite is obviously, uh, good for for everybody, but um, I'm, I'm not really thinking about something as as huge as as as, as a pandemic. But as I say, going back to my uh, my um, uh, line down here, my wavy line, ec economies do change; they do go up and down. So, how sustainable is the income? Um, how sure can we be that uh, people will be able to? still repaying a loan in two, three, five years, or if it's a property mortgage. And uh, in my country, in the UK, we give property mortgages for 25 years. So you, you, you really need to be looking a long way into the future when you're thinking about uh, a loan which is going to last so long. Just one thing that we haven't particularly uh, talked about yet, uh, which I think is, is worthy of talking about and that's
do people have an intention to repay or a willingness to repay? And unfortunately, in every banking career, you will come across people who are trying to mislead you, who are trying to hold back information from you, not telling you the whole circumstances so that you will lend them more money. And willingness to repay is another thing that we should be trying to get um, uh, information about. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier, did, uh, have, have they had previous loans? What's their credit history? How do you assess um, uh, a younger person who's never had a loan before? Um, their, cre their credit history is non-existent. So we need some ways of trying to uh, assess, are these reliable people? Are these honest people? Are these trustworthy people? And the word that I use a lot when I'm uh, teaching uh, lending, whether it's commercial lending, whether it's um, small business lending, whether it's um, uh, consumer or, or pers personal lending, is evidence. Are you simply relying on assurances that people give you, or do you have actually evidence? Can you see from the bank account that they have a certain amount of uh, income every month? Can you see from the bank account that they um, have a surplus income? Can you see from the bank account that perhaps they uh, uh, have regular payments to savings institutions, or better still, they save within your bank and you can see them actually uh, acquiring uh, money? Uh, you can see them acquiring uh, uh, deposits and, and building up their, uh, their ability to withstand the financial shock, which is what we all hope to do, really, isn't it? We all hope to be in a position that even if we uh, have to face another 12 months of COVID, which I hope we don't have to do so, but uh, who knows? Because um, I was reading even this morning that there's a new variant coming from uh, India, um, which is what, what do they call it? It's like a, a, a super mutation or something. So it's not like the mutations that we've had so far. And they're not sure whether, whether the existing um, uh, vaccinations will, uh, will be good against it. So, you know, these things are still uh, with us at the moment and we're st still having to, uh, having to cope with that. So um, willingness to repay is one of the tests that we need to uh, satisfy ourselves with. The second thing is the this um, uh, ability to repay. And we've looked at uh, on the whiteboard here, lots of other things to think about when we're thinking about all of that. And looking at income and expenditure, looking at uh, assets which people have, have uh, uh, acquired, looking at uh, the interest which they have to pay, looking at dependents and possible future uh, outgoings. Um, I saw that Miguel sent out um, the first um, uh, handout to you for this uh, program. And in that script, if you've had the time to look through it, there's a, a few documents to complete in there. There's a budget planner, there's um, uh, a kind of a domestic balance sheet showing uh, total uh, loans and total commitments and total liabilities and also total assets. So are people, do people have uh, surplus assets over their liabilities? We think a lot about that when, we, when, when we're thinking about business loans, but it's true to a certain extent in, in um, personal finance as well that we want people to have um, more assets than they have liabilities. Uh, we don't want people to be too heavily committed, uh, unable to repay uh, all the loans uh, which they have. So having the ability to assess um, the, uh, the number of loans that people have. I'm, I'm not quite sure of the, the situation in the Bahamas. Can you tell me? Uh, I, I guess that, you're, that you have credit reference agencies there. Are they able to tell you about loans in other, other institutions? Uh, can you tell me, please? Well, currently we don't have anything like that. We, they have the credit bureau or they have yeah. a credit bureau that, sh that they've been talking about for a while. So that should um, establish that. But right okay. now what, what banks do is they require a, a, a reference letter or a letter of credit. Okay. So once you mention that, hey, I bank with another bank, and if you mention that you have a loan or anything like that, then you have to provide a letter of credit. Ah, okay. 
the state, how have you been managing this facility? Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah. well, when I was, it, sorry, go on, please. No, uh, please so the credit bureau is up. That's how they've been doing that. Okay, um, uh, credit bureau is one of the uh, one of the things that IMF is really keen on in, in a country. So. Um, I, when I think about it now, within the report that I looked at, I only scanned it quickly, but um, I think it's probably one of the recommendations within within the IMF. It's one of the things that they're very keen on in in, uh, in countries, and it, it certainly helps uh, credit assessment when when there is a fully functioning uh, credit bureau that has access to uh, people's repayment history and um, uh, the number of times they're asking to borrow uh, money. Uh, if they've got any county, if they've got any court judgments against them, uh, trying to seize money back because they've defaulted on loans, those kind of things, all of that's really useful information uh, for a credit bureau to keep. So the fact that your your country is now uh, developing that is uh, will certainly help in the future. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you for that. I hope uh, that helped a little bit. Um, we've covered quite a lot of um, what the uh, what the book uh, or what the the handout that Miguel sent to you uh, has said in or says in this discussion which we just had but just let me clear this now um, okay let me bring this back on another um, uh, mnemonic that um, uh, we use a lot and we're going to use this for the business uh, uh, case as well uh, so I'll, I'll tell you what it is now it's actually based on on an Italian drink you may have seen it before. It's called Campari. Does anybody know what the letters of Campari stand for? C stands for character. What kind of character am I dealing with? Is it an honest person? Is it a trustworthy person? Do they have a good reputation? The A stands for ability. So that's skills and knowledge, but it's uh, it's also financial ability. How do people manage their finances? The M stands for margin. Will the bank get a good uh, margin from that? But it also st st stands for means, especially in business uh, lending. Do they have uh, the, the right uh, means, the right equipment uh, to operate the business? The P stands for purpose because we're interested in the purpose. We don't lend for all the things that our customers might want to uh, borrow money for. So we assess the purpose and, and see that it's a suitable purpose. And we also have percentages that we're prepared to lend for particular uh, purposes. So uh, we might lend 95% uh, of one thing, but only 80% of another thing. So understanding the purpose of the loan is, um, is uh, very important. So we've got um, the purpose. The A stands for the amount. So if somebody's asking for a loan of uh, $10,000. And our first question is, how much is the item going to cost that you're buying? Because it's very rare that we would lend 100% of, uh, of anything. We like, to, we like people to make some kind of a, a contribution uh, to uh, the, per the purchase. Uh, if, the, if people are buying a car or something like that, are they making a, a contribution? Or are they borrowing 100%? Uh, the, um, the R stands for repayment. And the I stands for insurance. And insurance in this sense doesn't actually mean only life insurance or fire insurance, but it, it means insurance, what happens if things go wrong? Uh, are, are you going to uh, take uh, collateral or security for this uh, loan? It tends to be for smaller loans that banks don't bother with, with collateral or security because it's just too much trouble for the amount of money lent, but certainly for domestic uh, residential property, uh, a bank would all, always take uh, collateral uh, for that because it's a very big asset and the client uh, is going to give us a, uh, um, a charge over that asset so we can sell the asset if anything goes wrong. So remembering Campari 
is uh, is useful. You'll definitely need it in the business lending that we're talking about next week. And uh, it's something, uh, I think it's probably quite easy to, uh, to remember and quite easy to uh, use once you do remember it. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about um, the um, lending assessment, but uh, so much um, commercial credit, sorry, not commercial credit, consumer credit these days is done by credit scores. <clears throat> and this is based on uh, most US lenders use, it says at the bottom here, the FICO method, which is the, from the Fair Isaac Corporation. So they're all using a very similar uh, credit scoring uh, tool. And people get uh, assigned a credit score based on a few criteria. And I'm going to give you some what some of those criteria are. But they're actually very similar to the criteria that we would use when we're assessing uh, a loan uh, without credit scoring. I can tell you that um, in my bank, uh, Barclays in the UK now for probably for almost 30 years, uh, most um, consumer loans have been done purely on credit scoring. Um, when was it I had a loans officer who would assess a, a credit loan? Probably, probably finished that around about 1988, something like that. So quite a long time ago that we had loans officers who would uh, see an application form, look at the information, look at the budget planner, look at the, uh, the various uh, parts of the information, all this information which we discussed a few moments ago, um, uh, length of time in a house, those kind of things, and make a judgment. Most uh, lending, certainly for consumer type loans, is done on a credit scoring uh, basis now. <clears throat> And factors affecting uh, the credit score would be things like um, um, outstanding debt. So, and what's their debt to credit ratio? So how much debt have they got? How much would we think is the maximum that they could borrow? The length of the credit history, have they been borrowing for 10 years, 15 years, or never had um, uh, uh, things before? I've managed to miss an N out of that. New credit inquiries, how often are they asking for credit facilities? That, that's the kind of information which is kept uh, by a credit uh, bureau, which I was mentioning a few moments ago. Um, the type of credit that people have, is it revolving credit? Is it installment loans? <clears throat> revolving credit means um, I, I give you uh, an overdraft and you perhaps buy something with it. The money comes back into the account, but then you salary with your salary, but then you spend the money again and it revolves, uh, the, the limit goes up and down, as opposed to um, installment loans where I lend you $10,000 and after, the, after month one, uh, the balance is uh, nine, 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 eight, and it goes down $100 a month or something like that. So what type of credit uh, do you have? And then demographic, demographic information, uh, your age, your marital status, number of dependents, uh, those kind of things. And this information is compared with the credit performance of other consumers with similar histories and similar profiles. So over the years, the bank uh, develops or the financial institution uh, uh, develops a credit score, which shows how risky people within those categories are using big data to assess a whole range of, uh, of uh, criteria and cross-referencing it all to, to give people uh, different uh, scores depending on that and other information. I mean, some lenders have their own scoring methods uh, which um, include uh, similar things. Uh, Barclays uh, score, for example, was based very much on a behavioral score for how their accounts had operated within, within the bank. Uh, and you, be, you might be interested to know that they initially uh, assessed nearly 200 data points uh, from the, the bank's uh, information and finished up with the 20, I think it was 26 most predictive data points as accurate information to feed into the credit score. Um, I don't think anybody else is going to join us at this stage. So 
and I might put it back onto onto this now. Makes it easier for everybody to see. So we think about the debt burden ratio. Um, how much uh, is the monthly periodic payments that you must make? This monthly debt burden will be the amount of money you must pay for your creditors every month. So that includes minimum credit card payments, home loan payments, card payments, recurring bills from creditors. And then the debt burden uh, ratio is defined uh, as your debt burden divided by, divided by your net income. So your monthly outgoings is uh, 1100, your monthly income is 1500. So what's the ratio between the two things? And, and, and you, you can then assess um, how likely it is that people are going to be in a position to repay your loan looking at this debt burden divided by net income. We talk with collateral lending, uh, 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 we use a, a, an LTV, which is a loan to value ratio, which is the amount you owe compared to your home's property or to the collateral's value. So if you have a, a loan against your house for 80,000 and your home is worth 100,000, uh, the, the LTV, the loan to value is 80%. And that means you have 20% equity in your home. Uh, the loan is 80%, so you must have either made an investment of $20,000 or you've made repayments of up to $20,000 so that you, you effectively own 20% of your, uh, your home and the bank has a charge over your home for the other 80%. We use the same uh, ratio if we're assessing a loan, uh, but using it as uh, collateral for a business loan or for any other kind of collateral that we might take. We sometimes take collateral over other assets such as vehicles or large machinery. We take uh, collateral for business loans over inventory or stock uh, or um, uh, receivables. So we take um, collateral over lots of different assets. Um, we take uh, charges or collateral over people's stocks and shares, which are quite a nice collateral to have. Sometimes people have investment types of in insurance policies and we take uh, uh, collateral over that. So lots of different collateral that we can take for consumer or business uh, lending. But the big issue is this over indebtedness. And uh, in, in a career of 50 years of uh, banking, uh, you do come across people who, who get themselves horribly over indebted and the weight of the debt um, can cause people to be very much in this situation that you can see on the slide here of people literally hanging on and trying to pay the finance for uh, all of the loans, all of the commitments that they've made in the past, just struggling to pay the interest, to pay the, uh, to pay the principal payments. And uh, just living from day to day. And uh, you'll be amazed really, uh, I, I could tell you about a number of clients that I had when I was in this situation myself. I remember um, uh, a doctor, uh, very well paid um, family doctor. He, he was the principal partner in, his, um, in, in the local practice <clears throat> and highly respected in the community. But people didn't know that he and his wife consistently spent more money than they than they than he earned and and they couldn't understand bearing in mind that I, I knew this guy for several years when I was in this particular branch they couldn't understand that the bank wouldn't lend them uh, more money to um, indulge their desire to spend more money which was more than they can, could actually afford and more uh, more than they were earning Clearly, when people borrow money, it's because they haven't got spare cash. But to overcommit themselves in that, in the way that they did, was just monstrous, really. And we we refinanced them several times, and in the end, we had to take away the credit guarantee cards, which is a really insulting thing for such a, a leading member of the the community to to have to to uh, to, to face really that they, they they literally weren't allowed any kind of a credit card or any kind of way of running up more debt 
because they just consistently over many, many years had no control over the personal finances, personally, financially uh, irresponsible to the extent that um, their liabilities uh, considerably outweighed their assets and their ability to repay all of this debt was just becoming weaker and weaker as the amount of debt that they incurred uh, increased. I had another guy that I just want to briefly tell you about. He had a really good job as a, an accountant within uh, a, a business. He was, the, he was the financial director of a large public company. He was on a massive salary, but he was always short of money. And I couldn't work out what the problem was with him. Why was he short of money? Why was he struggling? Why was he always um, uh, borrowing higher than his? He had a very high overdraft limit. We used to have a, a, a credit card in those days called a, a, a prime account. And those people had an automatic uh, unsecured overdraft of 10,000 pounds sterling, which is probably uh, going on for uh, 16 or $17,000, I guess, something like that, perhaps a little bit more. So this was a big, uh, facility and I'm talking 20 years ago so um, this was a lot of money that he could have unsecured but he was always at the top of his limit and it was only when I started examining the checks that he issued that I realized that he was regularly making payments to uh, casinos and I went around to visit him at his house he didn't come into the bank to see me I went around to his house to see him and he lived in a very small house and um, he, there was no signs of wealth at all and it was because he was he was actually uh, uh, a gambling addict he was uh, addicted to gambling and he was just losing all the money and again uh, we had to be really strict with that guy and he eventually got divorced because his wife could, just couldn't stand the stand the the stress of the whole situation anymore so here we have two highly paid individuals highly qualified but uh, financially uh, incompetent and financially um, uh, badly behaved, shall we say, for want of a better phrase. So just kind of be aware of people's, um, how, how sensible are they? Uh, you don't need to be a highly paid person to be highly honest and to be highly reliable in the way that you conduct your, your finances. And some, I, I've uh, dealt with thousands of uh, customers over my over the years and it isn't always the highly paid people who are the most reliable and the most trustworthy and the easiest to deal with there are lots and lots of um, reliable honest trustworthy people who are on fairly low uh, incomes so that's the end of the uh, presentation for today so uh, we've got a couple of things that uh, we can do now we've got um uh, just over 30 minutes. So what I'd like you to do, please, is to open the, uh, the book that um, uh, you received from Miguel uh, this week. I hope you have it uh, available and ready. It was called, just let me open it here. Financial situation analysis, here we are. Looking for the merged one, here we go. You, you, you received during this week the, the merged uh, paper, which was uh, drawn up initially by my senior associate, uh, Keith Checkley, who should have been with us today. Unfortunately, he's, um, he's uh, not able to, to join us uh, this uh, today, this morning, to be with you. But, um, uh, the things that we've been talking about, uh, this Campari, uh, the SAS uh, is all in here, finding out the facts. Um, we're looking at assets and liabilities. We're looking at uh, amounts of liabilities and the repayment amounts. We're looking at the conduct of uh, investment accounts. Uh, we're looking at banking facilities and their debt requirements and collateral if, if you're going to be taking collateral. And then is there any uh, anything if people become sick or suffer a, uh, a bad accident and would would stop them from repaying? Um, some banks insist, insist that clients take uh, life insurance, others, others don't. But there's a, there's, there's a checklist in here for you. And then there's also a personal balance sheet which can show uh, people's um, 
assets and the liabilities and their personal net worth. Do you own more than you owe? We'll do exactly the same thing, by the way, with business accounts next week. Does the clients, the personal clients, owe, own more than they owe? Do they have a personal net worth? It take a little bit of time to, uh, to, uh, to get, but one thing that we always did before we introduced credit scoring was we, we asked the client to complete a budget planner, which showed, as somebody was mentioning when we were having the discussion, the monthly expenditure. And then we assessed that against the, uh, the, the checking account or the current account, whatever you call it in the Bahamas, their normal banking account to see uh, do these figures make sense? Is this the kind of expenditure that, that, that these people are actually facing? Do they have net surplus at the end of each month? <clears throat> do they have any disposable income which is available to repay this new loan that they're asking for? There's the information here about Campari. There's, there's a, a, an information uh, form that you might wish to use if you're de de dealing with a a bigger um, case uh, using information gained, but then also information required. I still need to know more about this aspect. And maybe I need some um, evidence. And then there's a credit scoring model here for, uh, for um, residential mortgages and using a points score basis. And finally, this is a question. Yes. How, how do you determine the point score? Um, okay, well, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the points are actually proprietary um, points, so I'm not able to share the actual points with you because oh, um, th th unfortunately those are kept secret. I, I'm also guessing that each bank will have their own, uh, will have their own um, uh, scoring mechanism. If you don't, it's the kind of thing that if, if your bank doesn't have a credit scoring method at the moment, I can tell you that uh, if you're going into a credit bureau, I'm almost certain that they will be developing a credit scoring uh, basis. But I mean, we, we could almost uh, spend a few minutes now uh, guessing, you know, somebody who has family income of uh, more than 4,500 would have more points available than somebody who earns under $500 a month, for example. And people with a high net worth would have a high level of points. People with zero net worth would have less points. Um, then assessing their debt uh, ratio, if, they, if their total uh, cost is only 25% of their income, they're going to have considerably more points than somebody who, who has um, a, a debt ratio of more than 50%, for example. So uh, as I say, um, these unfortunately, these are secret. Most of the, um, the American banks use the FICO, F-I-C-O um, uh, method, which I uh, referenced to you a few moments ago. But unfortunately, those are pr proprietary, and I don't actually have uh, a, even a secret bank one that I could share with you at the moment, unfortunately. But you get the idea of how these points will be distributed depending on people's debt service ratio and their net worth and their length of time in employment. I can tell you, for example, that uh, people got points in the Barclays method for having a mobile phone. And you might think, well, everybody has a mobile phone. And yes, that's true. But um, if you don't pay your mobile phone bill, um, the, 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 uh, the phone is cancelled. So uh, that's an indication that you, you're at least keeping up to date with paying your mo mobile phone. So it's this kind of uh, information that people have built up over years. What are good indicators of um, strong credit history? What are weak indicators of good uh, credit history to, to come up with these uh, maximum scores and then the minimum passing score? And the good thing about a credit score is that, um, let's say, I think the model that I showed you a few moments ago had, uh, let me bring it back up again. Where was it? The maximum score was 800, uh, 850. And um, the average score was um, somewhere between um, uh, 600 and 700 as a kind of a minimum score. If your non-performing loans are going up because the economy is getting a bit weak, you can increase the score. 
And if you're not getting enough applications and your non-performing loan history is good, you can reduce the score because one of the things that we're always trying to avoid is saying no to people who are good credit risk or saying yes to people who are bad credit risk. That, that, those are the two um, default options that we're trying to avoid if, if at all possible, because we don't want to say no to good credit customers who fall below the score, but we don't want to say yes to bad credit, credit customers who fall above the score. So the, the models are being uh, constantly developed to try and make them more accurate, but all of the time we're trying to lend our money safely to as many good risks as possible and to avoid saying no to people who should have a yes answer and to avoid saying yes to people who, who should have a no answer. Okay, so that was the, um, uh, the paper. Let me, here we are. This is what I was trying to bring up. Um, I'm, I mentioned monitoring and control um, in terms of assessing people's uh, indebtedness, but a key element of monitoring and control is making sure that people make repayments on time. So um, I can tell you that not every bank has a good monitoring system, but believe me, they all need a good monitoring system. So uh, monitoring is one, is one, I've got, a, I have a problem with this uh, thing. If, uh, if I just press the, the little button, which is on the, the, the thing, it starts uh, doing this. <laughs> Here we go. Let me just clear it and I'll start again. This moves quicker than I can move, unfortunately, this, this, uh, this tool. Let's see, let's see if I can do it. So, I've done it again. It's going too quickly. And so every time I move, it's, it's doing that, which I don't want it to do. Third time lucky. monitoring. What we're um, concerned about all of the time is people making their payments on time. So what kind of monitoring system does your bank have to make sure that if somebody's payment is due on the 24th monthly, that on the 24th of the month, the payment is made? And do you get some kind of report to tell you people who are in arrears? People whose um, uh, checking account or current account is deteriorating. So sh showing de deteriorating positions. So do you get an arrears report? Do you get a deteriorating position report? Do you get any kind of uh, monitoring information to warn you that there might be a problem? Because uh, uh, lessons learnt over a long banking career is that the sooner you spot a problem, the sooner you take action, the lower your non-performing losses will be. Um, trying to identify problems early, taking strong corrective action, contacting the customer quickly, making sure that uh, they know that they've got to make these payments, taking legal action if they simply refuse to make payments, getting early action to, to reclaim assets which you perhaps finance is the best method because I can tell you that if people have got themselves into a financial mess, lots of other creditors will be doing exactly the same thing. Lots of other creditors will be trying to get their hands on assets which they can sell to repay loans. So spotting a problem early and taking action early, being the first on the scene is 
uh, is crit critical. And I can tell you that uh, banks aren't always good at this. They've, uh, they spend a lot of time trying to get new loans. They spend a lot of time assessing loans, but they don't spend a lot of time monitoring loans. And uh, the monitoring is equally important to the, uh, to the loan uh, assessment, the loan approval. <clears throat> so please be sure that you do monitor your loans carefully. I'll just tell you one very quick story. I, uh, I spent a few years working in Barclays on the uh, internal audit team. And one of the uh, roles that we had to do from time to time was when the bank was taking possession of, of properties uh, through the court, we'd have to attend with the bailiff. One person would have to attend with the bailiff uh, the court officer who went in, we had a locksmith there and we took possession of the property. And I've seen, I have to tell you, I've, I've seen some pretty dreadful uh, properties. Uh, people have deliberately left their property in fairly dreadful uh, state because the bank was taking possession of it. So don't always think that when you take possession of a property, uh, it's going to be the end of your problems because it's, it's sometimes the, the beginning of your problem. But I took possession uh, of this particular property on this particular day and, and the bailiff, the court official said to me, I wondered when the banks would start coming around to this property. So I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, these people have owe a lot, a lot of people, a lot of money. And I've been coming um, with court orders for a long time now. And I've been actually stripping the assets out of this place to repay the various debts. And finally, finally, after I've been coming to this property for over 18 months, the banks show up and now you're trying to get your money back. And um, that was a lesson learned for me that day because I knew that um, my bank weren't particularly good at, uh, at monitoring loans and, and taking early prompt action to make sure that uh, we, uh, we got a hold of arrears. And it was a lesson learned that other creditors are well ahead of banks. And if, you don't, if you're not one of the first, you'll end up being one of the last. And the, uh, the amount of pie that's left for you to, to eat, the amount of cash that's available, or, the, or the, the, the number of assets which are available for you to sell to repay your loans will be severely affected by any uh, late uh, arrival on the scene. So the sooner is, is the best, believe me when you're in a financially bad situation with the client. So I keep bringing that up by mistake because what I want to, to do is get to these case studies. And um, the case studies were set on, a, I've realized were set on a separate piece of paper. Have you actually received uh, case studies from us? Did you receive case studies? I've only received this document so far. That You've only received the one document. You haven't received the case studies. No, I haven't received anything for them. Okay, well, just just document. just let just let me make sure I've got the right folder open, then and then I'll I'll share them with you. Here we are. Case studies questions. So I'm going to uh, give it to everybody now in the chat. So just let me open the chat again. Here we go. Come back up to Michael. Okay, I want to bring this back up here. I need to stop sharing for a second. Here we go. Right. So I'm going to bring together to everyone. So now you've got all of the case studies for uh, for this uh, uh, for this course. So you've got James the Grocer, you've got um, Mr. Andrews, you've got Jane Brown. So there's one business case, um, which is James uh, the Grocer, but there's four personal cases. I just wondered if you'd like to spend um, five minutes reading this case and wondering what we should do with this, with this client. Mr. Andrews. So uh, if hopefully you have the capacity to, to, to build, sorry, to open the, uh, the case uh, now that I've shared it with you. But if you, if you could uh, read through 
uh, Andrews's case and tell me what you think about the case. Uh, I'd be quite interested to hear hear what you have to have to say about it. Miguel, uh, can you hear me at the moment? Um, yes, yes, my good man. Hi, <laughs> uh, I've just shared the uh, the uh, the cases. I, I guess you might have them anyway. But if you could make sure that the people who weren't able to attend today also receive those cases, that would be that not would a be... problem. I'm going to yeah, I'm going to email it to them right now. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you very much indeed. So it's um, on my clock, it's 16.39. So we've got 20 minutes left. So uh, perhaps if you just spent uh, 10 minutes reading that case and we can perhaps briefly discuss it, see what you think about it, please. This is a true case, by the way.
Okay, so we've just got 12 minutes to go now before uh, the uh, before we need to finish. So I should uh, be drawing you back now. I hope you've found that interesting to have a, have a look at. The, first of all, uh, before we start, can anybody tell me what a bridging loan is? Do you have such a thing in, in Bahamas? I guess that you probably do. Uh, Claudia, uh, bridging loan, can you explain what it is, please? Um, from what I know, it's just to get you from one, from in between loans, basically. So you're trying to get credit, but you all, you want a temporary loan just in the meantime, before you do your main line of credit. Okay, so so that's uh, that's a reasonable answer. What actually happens is that if I've got uh, a property, uh, this guy had a property which was going to be sold for sixty-five thousand, and he has another property which he's going to buy costing thirty-five thousand pounds. There's sometimes um, a gap between. Uh, the sale of the first property and the purchase of, of the second property. But you, uh, usually we do what's are called closed bridging loans. And a closed bridge is one where uh, contracts have been exchanged and the sale is due to happen, uh, let's say, in one month's time. However, I need to complete on the purchase now. So I need a bridging loan uh, of uh, cash from what I will get from the sale of my property to help me towards the purchase of the new property. And it's closed because um, there's a guarantee that the sale will be completed in one month's time or two months time, wh wh whatever it is, whatever the contract says. So the risk is actually quite low. Uh, and banks often get involved in closed bridging loans. Problems occur, and I, I confess that I've seen this myself in my own career, problems occur when people take open bridging loan. And an open bridging loan is where I want to buy uh, the property just in the same situation, but there isn't a contract. I haven't agreed the sale of my existing property. And I can think of two specific cases. One was a, a Premier League football manager. So he's a really famous guy. He used to appear on the TV every week at the end of matches, uh, being um, um, interviewed by the, uh, by, by the commentator to talk about games and what have you. But he came in with his financial advisor and he desperately wants to buy uh, a property. He had uh, an illness and, and uh, I won't tell you the person's name and I won't discuss the illness with you, but he had an illness and he needed to move into a different kind of property to help him to cope uh, with this illness, which was, becoming, uh, which was becoming worse. And I tried everything to persuade him not to take the, um, uh, the bridging loan. And uh, they insisted because he needed it and uh, he had plenty of money and he could afford to pay the interest on the bridging loan until the property was sold. So against my better judgment, but not really having an answer to say, no, this is a sensible person. Why should I stop him from doing what he's doing? I let him have a bridging loan and 12 months later, he hadn't sold the property. And the interest cost on the property that he'd bought uh, with his bridging loan was immense and he just couldn't afford uh, to pay it month after month after month. And in the end, he actually ended up selling the property which he'd bought and moving back into the property which he was still trying to sell because he just couldn't sell the property and the cost of the new property, the interest was uh, uneconomically high for him. So even with the best of intentions, 
an open-ended bridge is something you should really, really, really try and dissuade people from. I was unsuccessful in that particular case. I was unsuccessful in two cases and both of them worked out badly. Both of them, I tried really hard to persuade them. Both of them, they were highly um, paid, highly respected customers of the bank. They had lots of uh, assets. They had uh, savings, which would enable them to pay the interest on the loan for a long time. And financially from the bank's point of view, it, we didn't lose any money. It was ne never became a non-performing loan, but it was just such a bad financial decision to have taken. And I, I, I shouldn't have um, agreed to, I always feel bad about agreeing to let them do what they wanted, wanted to do because I knew that it could work out badly and, and it actually did. And that's that's the situation that Mr. An Mr. Andrews is in here. He's downsizing, he's moving to a smaller property. He's taken a loan on his uh, lower, on his new property um, uh, to finance this, but he, he's got a saving between the two properties of 21,000. So his, his mortgage is less. So he, he should uh, have some spare cash. But on the other hand, he still uh, needs to, uh, to cover the interest on uh, the um, uh, on the um, uh, on the new property, and he's still got to pay, of course, his interest on his old property until the property is sold. So he's still in this kind of uh, mega uh, situation of paying uh, the mortgage on the new property of thirty five thousand, but also the uh, interest on the bridging loan of uh, fifty five thousand which works out at approximately um, 642 uh, pounds a month based on the interest rate that's quoted in this. So he needs 642. So I've given you a clue to, to the story. Who, who, who wants to pass a comment on this? Anybody has any comments? Kermit, have you got a comment about this? Any thoughts about Mr. Andrews? Um, I just was able to get my um, word to come up, so I wasn't able to read it yet. Ah, okay. I'm sorry about that. Ho ho hopefully, no. Uh, what, what I will do in future is I'll make sure that you have uh, the cases um, in advance last, so that yeah. you, you don't have that problem in future. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Mm. Um, so, uh, this, bearing in mind the time, then, and there's only five minutes to go, let me just, just quickly tell you uh, the bank didn't do um, Mr. Andrews any favours by enabling him to go into this, because as I say, um, the interest cost on, on the loan that he's taking is £642 uh, pounds a, a month. And um, he's moved to a smaller property with a smaller uh, mortgage, which gives him probably somewhere in the region of £320 pounds saving. But there's still a shortfall between the, between the, uh, the saving on the new property and the interest which must be paid on the bridging loan of approximately um, 320 pounds round, round figures. So where's, the, the, where's all, the, all this extra cash going to come from um, now in his new situation? I, th I think the question from memory says that he's, he's just going to go into, he's just going to retire. So based on his income, how is he going to uh, repay this loan? How is he going to, for one month, two months, 12 months, pay the interest on the loan? And he's in exactly the same situation as uh, the, um, the Premier League manager, which I'm referring to, was. He hasn't sold the property for a long time. Any savings have run out. He's now borrowing money from other places and got himself into a real, a, a real mess with this, uh, with this um, uh, situation. So, Mister, what's he what's he going to what's he going to do? He's got two choices at the moment. He can either sell his existing property, the, the one that he wants to sell, but to reduce price so that he gets it through quickly. That would that would uh, solve the problem, but he would obviously end up losing money on that. Or the other alternative is to do exactly what the Premier League manager had to do, which was to sell the new property, which was easier to sell and move back into the old property. The, uh, this is a situation which 
came about by a bad lending decision by the bank and a bad financial decision by the clients. And escaping from it is the only, uh, is what needs to be worked out at this stage. So, to finish, I've got two minutes to finish. Uh, lending. I know lots of honest people who failed to repay loans because they overcommitted themselves. I know lots of honest people who became bankrupt. So please don't simply rely on honesty and on an assessment of honesty when you're assessing lending capacity. Lending capacity is also about financial management, financial discipline. It's about understanding uh, the person's character. It's about understanding their ability. It's about understanding the purpose of the loan and their other commitments. It's about understanding uh, their ability for repayment, bearing in mind their total budget planner. And in the, um, in the case of collateralized loans, the amount of collateral which is available. So I hope you found today uh, interesting and useful. Uh, as I say, you've got a note there which summarizes uh, the things which I've said. I'm happy to share the slides with you which I've, uh, which I've used today and I'll, I will uh, pass those to uh, Miguel later so he can share, this, share the slides with, with you if you want to refer to them. I'll send them as a PDF uh, for you. And um, next week we'll be talking about business lending. So we'll be looking at um, financial analysis of a business case. We'll be using the Campari uh, method uh, to assess a business case, but also looking at a, another very useful mnemonic which I've, which I've got, which will help you to better understand um, a, a business case. And then we'll uh, look at that in, in more detail. So um, before I go, we just, you've just, just got a moment or two. Does anybody have any questions for me before we leave and before we close today? Um, we'll, we'll go to the case studies. Um last class or you want us what you want uh, I, there's nothing that i need you to, to read before the next class uh, okay come in. if 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 you looked at this merged document uh, where's it gone just let me bring it up oh that's the that's the answer just here we are if you looked at this merged document and looked at uh, briefly read this it, it isn't many pages that would help you to join into the into the discussion with me. I think there's perhaps uh, 15 pages before next week. So if you had a look at that, that would be good. But um, I'm going to be talking about the ratios that are mentioned in here, and we're going to be looking at uh, liquidity and uh, profitability and gearing to assess a business and, and, to, uh, and to show you how those things are, are, are used. So okay. any time that you're able to spend reading those 15 or so pages will be time well spent. Uh, but um, that, this is what I will be going through with you next week. Any other questions? Okay, uh, thank you for your attendance. Uh, I can actually tell you that I'm looking at a sky which is very similar to the Bahamas sky at the moment, which is most unusual for me. I can't see any clouds. All I can see is blue sky. And I'm looking at a slightly lower temperature than you guys are looking at, unfortunately. But so I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. And I look forward to working with you again uh, next Saturday morning. Thank you very much, Miguel. Yes, thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending. So we'll see you all next week, same time, same place, 10 a.m. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Um, okay. okay. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.